too. While y'all are getting seated, and we'll talk more about these chairs in a minute, a uh, very dear lady uh, is here with us today, Brother, uh, Brother Fred Heath. Uh, we, we got Brother Fred Heath. He had retired from pastoring the uh, at, at, there in Grand Prairie and Brother Heath came down and he's been uh, helping Brother Art in the hospitals and seeing a lot of our seniors and things but his dear wife Billy hadn't got to be with us because her health has been has has been a little bit poor but she is with us today would y'all just give her a big hand <laughs> guys Sister Billy Heath Sister Billy Heath is one of those that paid the price to, to, to help spread the gospel uh, all through the Metroplex and everything Brother Heath's ever been able to do, he's been able to do through his little wife. She's one of the most lovely, genteel Christian ladies that you will ever meet in your life. And I just, I thought I'd saw her there and looped around and, uh, and got to talk to her there for a second. And uh, when you get to get out today, especially those of y'all on this side, y'all be sure and let Sister Heath know that you are glad that, uh, uh, that she's here. I got a new set of glasses and I've lost them already. I can't lose these. These are real ones. Uh, these ain't dollar stolen. So I, I, I set them up there, Brother Dave. Yeah, they, they got some fancy tint to them. Yeah, I slang them. I got the ones that the frames will bend up. I paid extra for the ones that you can throw across the church sanctuary, and, uh, and they won't bend. But they tint, and when you come in, and when the, whoever turned off the lights over here, uh, I couldn't see a cotton-picking thing. So that's my new glasses. That's what Brother Todd's supposed to look like from now on. And uh, my wife said, Man, now maybe that I'll quit doing this to you while I preach at you. So uh, I'm going to try to keep my glasses on. Well, if you are our guest, uh, I am not as uh, crazy as uh, you might think, uh, though some in this church would differ with you. Uh, uh, and if you're our regular, one of our members, you say, Brother Todd, what in the world? Why can't I sit in my favorite spot? And I know some of y'all, Brother Juan Bistro, I've been praying all morning that he wouldn't have a seizure from not being able to sit on the back row in the middle. But uh, we, as I was saying earlier, we got these chairs in uh, this past week. We bought 200 new chairs. $10,000 worth of your tithes and offerings. If you was tithing off your money, that means you had, we had to go out and, and work and make about $100,000 to live off of and took a tenth of it brought it here to the storehouse, brought it to the church, and this is one of the things we just bought with it. Now, we was all sitting in here fine. We was all sitting in here comfortable. You didn't have to really sit up on somebody that got on your nerves or, or too close to this one or that one. But uh, we didn't build this building. We didn't plant this church for us to ever be comfortable. Amen? We talked last week about the reality that Christ said there is a conflict in Christmas. There's a conflict that he came into the world. In fact, we've looked at one verse where he said he didn't come to bring peace but a sword. In other words, there was going to be a confrontation. We looked at the fact that the very first promise that God ever made about saving us, he told Satan, he said, uh, you're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. And we knew that there was going to be conflict. And the conflict brings the peace. Does that make sense? You can't have peace till, till the war's been won. You, you, if we were at war, we're not going to have war uh, in America. If we're at war as a country, we don't have peace till the war's won. And, and that's, that's the reality of our salvation. That is the reality of, of us, mankind, and God. Jesus said in Luke chapter uh, 19, and you don't have an outline today. I, I'll tell you about that in just a second. But in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, the Word of God says that, that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And he, and he began that process on earth when He came on earth, when He became a little baby at Bethlehem. Luke chapter 2, uh, it tells us that, that, that Jesus was born, they put Him in a stable, the angels went out, and they, uh, uh, and they, they told shepherds some of these words. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. That's the result of the conflict. Jesus said, I came to bring a sword. It was gonna, there was going to be a conflict. 
but, the, but, but also in coming, there was going to be a seeking, and there was going to be a saving, and that saving is ultimately going to bring us to peace. Now, I knew that I'd probably mess up our worship service when I set the chairs up like this. I knew that I'd probably throw you off when I didn't give you an outline this morning. But what I'm hoping is what I'm going to talk about is going to be worth it. You don't need an outline today because what I got to ask is too simple. You, you, you will have no problem putting what I've got to say today in your pocket and walking out the door with it. I got four questions. Four very simple questions, as a matter of fact. Two of them might produce some difficulty, but they are simple. Let's begin it this way. When the Lord said, would you bring up verse 14 again, Brother David, just leave it there for a second. When the Lord said through the angels that what he wanted on the earth was peace and goodwill towards men, do you think he was telling the truth? Do you think that's what God really wants for people? What about it? this side over here? You're kind of quiet. Yay or nay? Okay. Do we really think that God wants people at peace? So if so, it begs this first question. Are people worth saving? Are your loved ones worth saving? Are your friends, your co-workers, even the person that cut you off in traffic, perhaps even the person that's done you real harm. That's a little bit tougher one. But at the end of the day, if God could make it all right, would that be okay? And it is it what God really wants. What about you? Are you worth saving? You say, well, Brother Todd, I'm... I know some of these people probably think that they're worth saving, but I'm going to tell you, man, I, I, got a, I got a pretty dim view of me. But you know what? I can challenge that by Jesus hanging on a cross for you. I can challenge what God would want for you and what you might even think you deserve. And, and I could say to you readily today that you and I, to God and to those who have the heart of God, you are worth saving. If that is all true, second question is really simple. What are we willing to do to bring the gospel to people? If they're worth saving, and if we say this is God's will in people, then what are we as Christians? You say, Brother Todd, I'm not a member of this church, so what? The, 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 the question still remains. If I call myself a believer in Christ, what am I willing to do? What am I willing to pay for people to hear the gospel? Because it's the gospel that saves them, the story of Jesus. Paul said it is the gospel, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to those who believe. Amen? It ain't, let's get them to victory. It's let them hear the gospel. Amen? The Lord's intention, we read from this verse, is for people to have peace. And I'll tell you right now, if you're here today and you're really searching for something, I can guarantee you what you're really looking for is to be at peace. You are looking to be at peace with God. You are looking to be with peace with people. You are looking to be at peace within your own mind. Tell me if I'm lying. Tell me if you came here looking for something. You weren't looking for something that would ultimately satisfy your soul to the point that you could go, ah. Don't tell me that you're not interested in something that when you're laying on your deathbed and somebody comes up to you and says, is it all well? Are you ready for eternity? And you, can you honestly say when you're about to die, hey, I'm okay. I know where I'm going. I think a Lynn Smith, one of our members, used to sit about right over there, dying with the cancer. I knew the last time I talked to him would be the last time I saw him. I said, brother, are you okay? 
He said, Todd, I'm fine. I know where I'm going. I know Christ has saved me. What is he basically telling me? Todd, I'm at peace with God. I'm at peace with this moment. I am sad. I don't like this moment, but I'm satisfied in this moment. Something real. It only comes through the gospel. God wants us to be at peace. And guys and gals, people are worth searching for. Jesus said, another passage in Luke, in Luke chapter 15, You'll recognize the verses as Brother David brings them up. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, doesn't leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after the one which was lost until he finds it? And when he finds it, he, he lays it on his shoulders, what? Rejoicing. God wants people to be at peace. God wants people to be reached. In your chair, every other chair, on that side and on that side, are little bitty cards. Little bitty cards. They look kind of like this. If you got them, hold them up. If you don't put them up, that's okay. You ain't got to dig them out of your pocket. That little bitty card just says simply Christmas on it. Simply Christmas. It ain't flashy, ain't nothing there but a manger. And all it says on the front is celebrate Christ at Victory Church. You turn the page over and you see the date is December the 24th. Christmas Eve's on a Sunday this year. 10 o'clock in the morning. We're not going to have life group. Not going to have anything going on later that day. Just one service, one chance. To overflow this building. I may use, and Bo, I ain't trying to call you out. Where you at, Bo Preston? There, see, Bo, if he, he's not bashful. There, if I was there with a day, I was going to use Bo as, a, as an illustration. I might have called up some other things, but anyway. I, Bo's, Bo's got a lot of kin folks here with him today. And I thought, I said, why are they here? He said, because I asked them to come. And I told him, I said, you know, the, me and his daddy was walking up. And there, I was glad to see you two boys together walking up to him. Because, Bruce, I know he'd been worth killing. I ain't going to sit here and say he had me. And honestly, I might have I hit him with a rock. If you'd have hit him with a rock, I wouldn't have called you out on it. Amen, Bo, you know I love you. But I saw y'all walking up, and I, I, was, I was just glad of heart over it, you know. And, uh. And I said, uh, I told Bo, I said, you know, the number one reason most people say that they, they've never been to church is because they've never been asked. And I don't know if, if that's true for everybody that says it, but I'm going to tell you what, I know it's true for a lot. Because, guys, there's a lot of people who don't know nothing about Jesus. We, some of us older folks assume that, well, they, they live here in America. They, they know they ought to be in church. That, that's, that's, that's over. That's gone. There, there are more people in this room today that grew up in a home where there was very little, if anything, known about Jesus than there are people who grew up in church and Sunday school and going to Baptist training union. That is a reality. But everybody needs the same thing, and I got news for you. Everybody wants the same thing. We want peace. We want satisfaction. You say, well, Brother Todd, I, I've asked somebody. I, I got this card. I see you got another little card. Brother Todd, you're the card preacher. You pass out cards for everything. You say, Brother Todd, I got cards from, from 2008, Easter. And that's the problem. You still got the cards from 2008, Easter. You say, Brother Todd, I've asked some of the same people to come ten times. I'm going to use the words of Brother Charlie Wilson right now, and I'm going to tell you this. Don't say no for somebody. You might not think they would come, but they might. On, on, on December the 24th, all I'm going to do is share the gospel. I'm going to start at the manger. I'm going to get to the cross. And hear me, I'm going to do it as fast as I can. Don't mean it'll be quick. just means I'm going to do it as fast as I can. 
say, Brother Todd, they might not get saved. They might not. They might. I'll tell you what they will do. They'll get close to the gospel. When they hear about Jesus and the Spirit of God softens their heart about their need, you might be surprised what they do. Now, at the back of the store, back of the store, it's Christmas time. I don't, I don't mean too many sales, I guess. In the back of the sanctuary on the table, there's some door hangers say the same thing these say. Grab a handful. There'll be people standing there with handfuls of them when church is over today. Now, you live around some people. You, you do. You live around some people. Go up to hang it on the door. Knock on the door. Tell them I go to Victory Church. I'd like you to come. Hand them this. If they ain't there, you just slip it. Simply hand it on the door. You say, Brother Todd, they got a gate and they got a bad dog. Well, I, I would just put it in the mailbox. But it's against the law. If you're going to put a stamp on it. So, put a stamp on it and stick it in the mailbox. And if we need to get forgiveness over it, we will. Say, Brother Todd, you just told me to sin. That's kind of a gray area, isn't it? What I'm just saying is, somebody needs this. We all got a chance. We got a chance. Somebody helped us when we was down. Somebody helped us when we was backslid. Somebody helped us when, when we were the drunkard, when we were the thief, when we were the liar, when we were the gossip. Somebody, somebody helped us. We cannot be the type of Christian that are just glad for what God has done for me and mine. And sit around here in our good little old church and enjoy each other's company and the blessings of God and, and, and not be a people with a hand out in the same direction that somebody reached out into when we got found. And that brings us to these chairs. I, I wonder what soul that God is loved and died for. That don't know nothing about Him right now. That in His perfect will, He would have them sit in this chair one day and hear them, and let them hear about His Son. The girl that just said that's right, Cindy Frazier, Cindy used to run off people would come talk to her. she cuss them out. But let me tell you what happened. God started working on her heart. And there was somebody that didn't mind getting a cussing for Jesus that reached out, and guess what? Instead of getting a hand slapped back, it was embraced. She's one of our greatest prayer warriors. I could get her up here right now and stand her in front of you. Tell her this, Cindy, think about Jesus. Don't say a word. Think about Jesus. And the biggest tears you've ever seen will start running down her face. She's crying right now. Vernon Smith, one of our trustees, praise God, go Vernon's got to be back with us. We're so glad he's, he's back, back where he's, where he's supposed to be and can be. But Vernon, Vernon was just an alcoholic. Somebody asked him to come to church and walked into Robin Wood Baptist Church, heard about the gospel, didn't do nothing with it, went home with it, but the Spirit of God was eating him up. And Vernon, am I wrong? It was about midnight. It was about midnight he called out. Come on, stand up and holler out. What was it? 10.30 that night. He's crying now too. 
By midnight, he was pouring out all his booze. Jim ever said he was pulling booze out from all over the house. Said he didn't know a man could keep so much alcohol in one place. He's one of our trustees. He's one of our soul winners. That knee gets a little bit better. He'll be standing right up here during the invitation time doing what, somebody? Crying. That's what he'll be doing, crying. My brother Troy's here today. Troy used to ask me when he got to coming back to church, Todd, who's that man who stands up front of church and cries? I said, that's Vernon. Troy started calling him Crying Vernon. There was a chair over there about where y'all sitting. That Troy was sitting in one day when his life was coming to an absolute end. When doing things his own way, it cost him everything. And he finally broke, sitting right over about there. Walked down here, down to this aisle, and God broke him. Guess what God put in his eyes? Tears. Now Crying Vernon's got the company of Crying Troy. I can stand, I can stand him up here right now and I could make him give you his testimony. He'd cry all the way through because God did something for him. Praise God there were people that were always reaching out, always clinging out, always calling out. Lindsay, girl, I thought about little Malachi. Is he in here today? Is he, is he asleep? Bless his heart. I was going to hold him, but I ain't going to wake him up. No, I don't want to wake him up. Little Malachi, uh, if I had not put up these yellow papers, would, would have probably been what, about right here? Started off in this world without a chance. Without a chance. God sent along a couple to help him. Now there's parents. And that little boy, Lord willing, will hear about Jesus sitting about right there. He'll get over there in the nursery, in the kids' zone. He'll grow up. I was thinking about him this morning, maybe being about 16. Probably sitting about there because, you know, none of us ever change. So where we say it's where we say it. How many of y'all got the hives right now because you're not in your chair? Anybody just scratching like a crackhead, right? I mean, you just can't, can't deal with it. I can just see him there. Lord, Lord tears is coming and y'all don't run me off as a pastor preaching and seeing him sitting there about 16 years old, saved already, you know, missionary in his school, knows who he is in the Lord, has a direction in life. Somebody got to bring him. Somebody got to reach him. The reason I put these silly yellow stripes on this deal is I didn't want us just to walk in here today and go, oh, good, we got new chairs. Oh, good, we got more space. But I wanted you to see people in them. I want you to see not so that, oh, everybody says, oh, look at Victory. Victory's growing. They bought us some more chairs and more people are coming. So what? It's the person, not the count. It's, the, the, it's, not the, it's not the 200, it's the one. Who do you see sitting in one of these chairs? Some of y'all been here at Victory while you got your 4x4 four four card. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you can pick one up when you leave today. Real simple little card. Hey, Brother Todd and his cards, right? Yeah. And uh, you, go, you got a place there for four names. You identify them. You intercede for them. You invest in them. Guess what? You invite them. That's what that card's for, for that's there in your, in your seat. Invite them. Now's the time to be asking your people on your four before card to come to church with you on Christmas Eve. Do you see them sitting here? You say, oh, Brother Todd, I don't know if they'd come. I'm glad Mike Barron didn't think that about about his brother-in-law when he asked him to come to man church. Lord help, Mike's done seen three of his four saved. You know, he's a new believer. He don't know no different than to pass the card out. He don't know no different than to pray for him. He don't know no different than to ask him. Who do you see here? How many little Malachi's are there? How many Vernons are there? How many Cindy's are there?
Come on now, for real. Let's, let's be victory here a minute. Let's not just be no church congregation. Who do you see sitting in one of these chairs that would make your heart glad that they were hearing the gospel? Who would be sitting in one of these chairs right now that maybe one day during the invitation you was peeking when you shouldn't be? And you peeked to see if when we prayed and somebody asked Jesus to be their Lord and Savior that, that you was looking to see their hand go up. And maybe see their hand go up. And maybe see them walk into that baptistry. And to enter in to the fact that God wants people at peace with Him and God wants people reached by His church. Now though you don't have an outline, when I was preparing one, I prepared a title. The title to today's message is For Glory and Goodwill. The goodwill is towards men, but the glory is towards the Lord. Remember, I said I have four questions. The first question is, are people worth saving? If the answer to that is yes, then what are we willing to do to reach them? The third question is simple as well. Does Jesus deserve the reward of his suffering does jesus the son of god deserve the reward of his suffering does jesus deserve the reward the outcome of what he went through for us. You know, one of my most convicting verses of Scripture is that who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He said, Brother Todd, why does that convict you? Because I know that it, it, it was my sin that brought the shame, but Jesus looked at me a sinner and said it was for joy. Let me tell you something, baby. You get this down in your little head. When Jesus left Gethsemane, having prayed, Father, not as I will, but as you will, he didn't go off praying like that, like after that, like we do. Well, I guess if it's God's will, I can't do nothing about it anyway. I, I don't know what else to do. I get God, you know better than me. Fine. But when the Father made clear the will in, in His humanity and in His deity, Jesus went to the cross with a joy, a gladness. Sorrowful, yes. Shameful, yes. He despised the shame. He never think He went through, but glad for what He was going to get out of it. It is an amazing thing to me that God looks at me and says for joy, Todd Peavy, I died for you on the cross. You're the outcome of the nails. You're the outcome of the crown of thorns. You're the outcome of, of the insult. You're the outcome of the stripes upon my back. He said, Brother Todd, I'm just an old dope head. Baby, I'm telling you for joy, for joy Jesus died for you. You say, but Todd, I'm just a whore. For joy, Jesus died for you. Iris Blue's here today. Iris is the longest serving volunteer missionary in the Southern Baptist Convention. She didn't start out that way. She started out as a harlot. She started out as, as a, a, a person who ran brothels. She started out as somebody on heroin. She started out in prison. Was it eight years, baby girl? Eight years, seven of them solitary confinement because she beat up all the guards. She was mean and wicked and hateful. 
and a foul mouth. You say, Brother Todd, let that poor, let that poor woman loose. If I let her stand up here and talk about it, she'll say it a whole lot worse than I am right now. She spent her whole life giving her testimony of what Jesus did for her. One day down, she heard somebody telling the gospel. Ain't nobody in the world looking at it from the outside would have thought that Iris, they called her Big Iris, that Big Iris was going to yield to the Holy Spirit. She heard the word, kneel down. She said, I'm a tramp. He said, the preacher told her, said, if you'll kneel down a tramp, God will raise you up a lady. And she's been one of the greatest ladies God's ever had. She's back there clapping her hands right now. So glad. Listen, baby, Jesus was glad to die for Iris. She had so many abortions, they told her, you can't have any babies. And I don't know that she, uh, she calls him her little baby, but he's the biggest guy in this room. <laughs> you ain't even got to wonder who I'm talking about. Turn around and look, he's the only head you can see. Her little baby boy sitting right there with her right now. Her and Blue been all over this world. Blue was a, just a liar and a thief and no count, nothing. He got invited to a Christmas dinner one day by Iris' brother. She said, you ought to come to eat Christmas dinner with us. I got a sister who used to be a thief and a liar just like you are. He said he didn't even want to come, but he, but he feared being alone more than he feared dealing with anybody. God saved him. And baby, let me tell you something. The Lord saved him because the Lord wanted to save him. And if God's calling you today, the Lord wants to save you. Jesus died on the cross for you, baby. You ought to come for your blessing, but you ought to also come that he get his glory. And church, it ain't just the need of man, of mankind, though that is great. Amen, right? But oh, don't Jesus deserve it. Come on now, come on now. Don't the Lord deserve one little card being passed out? Don't the Lord deserve one little prayer in the morning? Lord, you just let the first person I see today be the person you want me to give this card to. And I don't care who it is. And Lord, I don't care what they think about me. And you walk down there to North 40 or wherever it is you might call your little coffee drinking spot, and if the first person you see, give them a card in Jesus' name. Go to work. Ask the most miserable person there to come with you. You say, Brother Todd, I don't want to talk to them. They're horrible people and they're mean. Amen. They're horrible and mean because they don't know Jesus. Say, if I had a sorry boss, I'd be praying they got saved. For their good, Jesus' glory, and my betterment. It's better to work for a believer than it is some old, some old pagan. Does Jesus deserve his glory? And if so, what are we going to do to bring it to Him? What are we going to do to ensure? I'd remind you of this as though you needed reminding. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. The church is in heaven. In chapter 4, we've been praising God for creating us. In chapter 5, we begin to praise Him for redeeming us. And in the ninth verse, it says this, of the church of the living God, that they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll. That's the, the title deed to the universe. And to open its seals. Why? For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on earth. Does he deserve the reward of his suffering? I'm going to stand up here in front of you and say, yes, he does. I'm going to stand up here in front of you and say, the only regret I have in my life is that I have not done a better job bringing him his honor and his glory. Because if no other scripture, these scriptures tell me that the Lord suffered for me, that the Lord paid for me, and that the Lord has established me. What did it say? He said, for you were slain. It's that he has suffered for me. You have redeemed us to God. He has paid for us. We will be kings and priests to God. Verse 10. He has established us. 
I wrote this in my notes, brother. Because y'all was going to get an outline, but I changed my mind. He has suffered for me. I wrote over to the side of it. I know he loves me. My mama's in here somewhere. She's not in a normal spot because of her little baby. Yeah, I made you move. My mama would die for me. If it meant you torturing my mother unto death, if she thought she could make me feel better for one moment, she'd take it. Wouldn't we do that for our children? When I see that the Lord suffered for me, it screams to me, Winston, Lord loves me. I wrote beside it where it says He paid for us, where it says He redeemed us. I wrote down, I know he will help me. He done brought me in. In fact, he bought me in. Redeem means we, he bought us back. Baby, he didn't, bring us, he didn't bring us back to leave us destitute. He didn't bring us out. Moses said he didn't bring us out to leave us here. He brought us out to bring us in. The Lord paid a high price for me. Listen, when you got something you value, you take care of it. Amen? I thought about it. Some of y'all would think that I didn't want the new chairs messed up. Any of y'all got one of them grandmamas or aunt or something that got a new couch, but she leaves the plastic over it when you come over because she don't want it messed up? Right? Takes care of it. When this tells me the Lord paid for me, that tells me the Lord values me. That tells me the Lord will help me. I wrote down beside it where it says he established us. We're kings and priests. I wrote down, I know he will accept me. God's got a place for me. And God's got a place for you. Amen? Right? This side, right? This side, right? He got a place for these too. He got a place for these folks. He's got a place for the hurting. He's got a place for the helpless. He's got a place for the broken. He's got a place for the prideful. He got a place for the addicted. He got the he got a place for the homosexual. He's got a place for the little gal that's having abortions and the doctor that's done them. He got a place for the drunker. The only real question about this on this Sunday in Scurry, Texas, in this tin building, is do we? Do we? Are we willing to help to reach, to pay what it costs? I didn't know if y'all would ever really make it as a couple. I really thought you was crazy for marrying him, baby. I did, but I didn't know if it was my place to tell you. I feel now I ought to apologize. But he's worth it. And she's worth it. Zach, I told your wife, knock him out in his sleep. <laughs> Not really but I wanted to. I did. I almost told her one day, if you want me to come jump on him, we'll hold him down. You can hit him however you want. It ain't easy, but it's worth it. Dalton, I thought about you when I wouldn't go see you in the hospital. I told you the night before your sister's marriage. Now, don't you go out and do nothing stupid. And then you got in that wreck. And you was in that hospital, and I was thinking, I need to go see Dalton. And the Lord said, no, you ain't ready to see Dalton yet. And then I was like, I need to go see Dalton. And the Lord's like, no, he ain't ready to see you yet. And when he sent me, I walked in there and I saw that Bible. I said, oh, the Lord's talking to Dalton. I remember you walking in here, you were such a mess, Bubba. Such a mess. And look at there. You got saved. God's called you. You're a preacher. God's doing great things with you. How many people have been saved over at that treehouse? God's used to speak the gospel through you. We glad Dalton had a place.
Has everybody got what I'm talking about today? Amen. We can go home now, really. Let's, as believers, if you're here today, let's go out. I mean hungry for the people that the Lord is hungry for. Like somebody went out for us. Here in a minute, when we give the invitation, Brother Chris Cox and them going to come along. They're going to, when we start the invitation, they're going to take these ribbons up. And when they do, and when we start that invitation, I'm going to ask you to do one of two things. I'm going to ask you in a second, I'm going to lead a prayer where if God's calling you to be saved, you can be saved. And I'm going to ask you if you pray that prayer and you mean it unto God, there'll be people standing up front, and I'm just going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask you to come to one of them and just tell them, you know what, I prayed that prayer. I know Jesus loves me. He died for me. He wants to bring me to peace with him. And they're going to help you go forward. And I'm going to ask every other believer in this room, crazy as it sounds, okay? But if you're here today, if you're a believer, especially if you call your, this your church home, when we're in the invitation time, I'm going to ask you to slip out from where you are. I'm going to ask you to find yourself behind one of these chairs. Say, Brother Todd, I know we could break the strings. They call that pastor prerogative. I want you to find a chair, just maybe this one, and put your little hands on it. And while the invitation's playing and art's playing, to just bow your head and talk about the people that God might put in this chair. I pray that not one of these chairs will be left unprayed over. In fact, Brother Chris, y'all come get these, get these yellow things out of our way. When we stand up in a second and are singing the invitation, you take it as, as your license to walk up, grab a chair. I thought about the chairs you're sitting in. About 500 services, Sunday morning services, these chairs have been here. And there you are sitting in one today. And I know this, somebody prayed over, you, over that chair you're sitting in. If you were lost, that you'd hear. If you were backslid, that you could come back. And that if you was walking with the Lord, that God would give you the strength to keep going. Have somebody in mind when you hold that chair. Have that little gal that works down there at the Dollar General that's driving along at minimum wage trying to raise three kids. Have your doctor that has money but no hope. Have that brother-in-law that you're mad at sitting beside you, Lord willing, come a Christmas Eve morning. We got it? If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, you hear me. For joy, Jesus died for you. I'm going to believe that the Holy Spirit is calling you. Jesus said, unless the Father calls a man, he cannot come. But if he's calling, you can call. And the Word of God says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So I want to ask you right now, if you would, to bow your head and close your eyes. Did we get those can lights fixed by chance? Do we know? Okay. That's fine. Now, don't turn them off yet until we see if these come on. That's okay. Just bring it back the way it was. That's all right. We just got a little problem. Just go ahead and turn them cans off. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if God's calling you to be saved today, would you just say to God something like this in your heart, mean it unto Him in silence? As I say out loud, would you just say, Dear Jesus, I know I'm lost, but I know You love me, and I know You died on the cross that I might live. I ask You to come into my heart and life and be my Lord. Hello. I want to thank you for spending this time with us today.
I hope there was something that happened during the, the message or maybe during the, some of the singing that you saw that, uh, that spoke to you in some way. You know, one of the great things that happens when we talk about God's Word is God starts talking to us. You know, the Word of God says, in fact, Jesus, the Son of God, said that unless the Father draws someone, they can't come. One of the great things is that the Spirit of God, working in harmony, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, He seeks us and He calls us and He draws us to Himself. You know, if you're listening to me right now and you are already a Christian, you know this has already happened in your life at one point or another. Maybe now you're, as you listen to the Word of God, you're, you're feeling Him talk to you. He's probably leading you towards some type of decision. I want to encourage you, if God's moving you, to, to accept a challenge or uh, to take a step of faith, to, to just listen for God and expect that He's going to uh, help you, that He loves you, and that you're one of His children. Sometimes, as He talks to us, it's not real comfortable. We have to remember that the Bible tells us that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And sometimes He does speak to us and lets us know there's a problem so that we see His Son as the solution and we kind of get back on track. If we can help you with that here at Victory Church, we'd love to. You can contact us uh, uh, through the website, uh, online, some way or another. I'm sure you can find a way. And, um, and we'd love to get to help you uh, uh, grow in your walk. Uh, perhaps, as you listen today, you've never really come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And you're experiencing that call for the first time. Uh, the Bible says God's not the author of confusion. So if he's speaking to you, he's... He knows what he's talking about. He's, if you heard during the message, there was probably a time where I was talking about coming to faith or, or being saved, as the Bible calls it. It's where God calls us out of the darkness of our sin and the separation that's caused by our sin as we recognize and we come to believe that Jesus died for our sins on the cross. He paid that price. He rose from the grave. He's alive, and he can give us life. And the Bible tells us that when we... When we come to a point of faith in that and we begin to speak to God about it, He enters into our life, He makes us His child, and He begins to make all kinds of, of great and wonderful promises to us. But there's two things that are absolutely essential, and that is that we believe uh, that Christ has died for us, that He's rose from, uh, for us, that He wants a life with us, and that our sin has us separated. You hear two big words when you read the Word of God. You hear belief and you hear repentance. We repent of sin means we turn from it, and we repent because we believe. We believe that Jesus Christ is our substitute for sin. He died on the cross in our place, and he rose from the grave. The Bible says to give us life. The way that begins to operate in our life is the Word of God says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so the reality is, is that God calls us so that we make a choice towards him. And we show our belief in that choice by believing enough to pray. Real faith always has, uh, it always produces something. It produces a work. In this case, it produces us believing enough to act, to speak towards a God we've never seen. We've never seen with our physical eyes or heard with our physical ears, but yet we know and we believe that he's leading us out of darkness into light and he's, and he's speaking to us. We, it's, it's, it's the loudest voice we never hear so to speak loudest sound you'll never hear is the call of god into your life but it's real and if you understand if uh the things we talked about today in the message what i'm talking about right now if god's calling you then you know exactly what i'm talking about you need to come to that point of decision um and the way you do that is to pray now you don't need my help to do it you can right now just ask the lord to Forgive your sins. Tell him that you believe that he died for you on the cross. He rose from the grave. That, that you want to repent of sin. Turn from sin and turn to him. And somewhere in there, the Lord will meet you in that faith. And he will save you. The Bible says for as many as have received him. And those that want to believe on him. The Bible says he, he calls those people his children. In fact, it says he gives them the power to be the children of God. If you say... Preacher, I don't really know what to say. In just a second, I'll lead you in a prayer where you could pray and ask Christ to be your Lord and Savior, but I want you to really understand what I'm about to say, and I think you probably know this. You, you don't get saved because you repeat after a preacher. You've got to believe what you say to God. But if you do believe that he died for you, he rose from the grave to give you life, that you want to turn from sin, 
then just bow your head right there where you are and just say these words out loud while I say them along, but be talking to God. Just say something like this. Just say, Dear Jesus, I know that I'm lost, and I know I can't save myself. But with all my heart, I believe you died for me. I believe you rose from the grave, and you can give me life. I ask you to come into my life, to be my Lord. I'll try to follow you, to be my Savior, because I need you. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Give me a new life in you that you tell me about in your word, and help me to begin to walk with you. And I pray this in Jesus' name, and just say amen. And if you're here, if you're listening to me right now, and, and deep in your heart you know that you wanted to accept Christ as your Savior as he was calling you, and you wanted to turn from sin and have him forgive your sin, then in the simplicity of, of that prayer and in the simplicity of faith, the Word of God says if you received him and believed in him, he gave you that power to be his child. Now, there's things to do. There's a life to live. There's great things that are going to happen in your life, and God wants to lead you through them, and you're going to need some help. If there is a Bible-believing church somewhere around you, and you'll know where that is because they talk more about Jesus than they do anything else. But uh, if, if you don't have a place like that around where you're at or you can get to, you can contact us here at Victory Church. Our web uh, address is victory-church.net, and you found us here on the Internet, so I imagine you can probably find our homepage. Just find us, send us a note. There's a way there to contact us. You can call the church. Uh, if you're where you can get to a call or call into America, it's 972-452-3751. And you can give us a call, and we'll try to help you with the things that you need to do next. I'm so proud for you, so glad for you. If, if, if you can, come back and be with us the next uh, simulcast, uh, the next podcast that goes out. Remember that uh, all of our, our videoed messages and even a lot of our audio messages are online. Uh, you'll find them archived uh, there in the website. If there's anything we can do for you, we'll try our best to do it. God bless you. We love you. And thanks again for coming by today. Hello.